Yeah, and yeah. That helped a lot. Great. All right, so um, we're gonna still give everybody another five minutes to join. Um, this is probably about half the sign up. So um, can we keep going? Are there other people on the line who are growing grain and wanna introduce themselves? I see Larry and Len are here. So maybe you guys, you probably know Ted, right? To be honest with you, I don't know uh, very many of the people that are certified anymore. We used to know, I mean, way back, um, like when, uh, oh, when Jennifer Morgan was the first, the director when I first got certified and Jennifer and then Karen Anderson and uh, Donna Bacho, we all seemed throughout the state to be a lot more uh, social than, than we are now. And, and I'm just as guilty as everyone else. I really don't have the time to socialize. Okay. That's a shame. Yeah, we well, hopefully we'll have a chance to all get together. Um, well, Ted, back then in the in those days, you could know all the organic farmers in New Jersey, and it's grown so much now. I don't even know the ones, all the ones in my town. I I, I don't I don't know too many. I mean, there may be some I do know. I haven't seen a list in so long, but it used to be, you know, we were all the way up at the top of the state, and then Tory Reid was all the way down at the bottom of the state, and you knew everybody in between. I'm trying to get Len and Larry to unmute. Hey guys, can you unmute? Hi, did you say, it's Larry, hi. All right, so Larry, introduce yourself to Ted and to the whole group. Oh, hi everyone. Uh, this is, uh, I'm Larry Mamarian uh, from River Valley Community Grains in Long Valley, New Jersey. Uh, my colleague Len Businich is also on and you know we've been working in a couple of years at helping to put together an infrastructure of support um, for farmers to transition uh, using grains uh, and away from conventional growing. So uh, we operate in a commercial kitchen right now in Long Valley um, where we have uh, four mills and an oat roller and um, just working with landowners and farmers to um, you know, work on that hyper local source of uh, grains. We've had uh, some folks in the Old Wick area put in some einkorn and Danko rye just recently and some warthog wheat and um, up in the Blairstown area in Marksboro area, um, Ruthie Peretti has been growing um, a winter wheat warthog and recently spring wheat this year uh, and uh, another um, connection up there with oats. So it's really great to see a lot of the things that we've talked about or had been talking about since 2016 as possibilities start to become reality um, and looking at ways in a collaborative effort to support each other, working with agronomists and farmers and landowners and, you know, being able to say to the community, you know, we can, we can basically get you a locally grown, healthier sourced product for you and your families and your schools and your institutions and you don't have to go far for it. Great. Uh, it looks like from the chat, is it Christopher Ross? Oh, there Hello. he is. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, Matthew and Annie Ross all joining here from up in Center Cambridge. We're a uh, hay and maple farm and we're adding about uh, eight acres of small grains starting this year. Right. All right. It's um a little after six, so um, you know, people are aware that we are recording this. So I should just let you all know we're recording it mostly for the purposes of sharing with the community. I hope that's okay with you. Um, we we also have videos and presentations, so we'll be sharing all of that online. So you can just go to the NOPA site and click through to all the resources. They're, um, they're all being assembled and posted as we go. Um, and tonight, um, we're very lucky to have Aaron Gabriel from Cornell and two additional guests from New York who are helping um, uh, all of us in New Jersey learn a little bit more about um, 
farming grain. So um, over to you, Erin, to introduce yourself in a little more detail and, and get started with the presentation. So my name is Aaron Gabriel. Uh, this January, I'll be with Cornell Cooperative Extension for 25 years, which seems like quite a while. Uh, with me tonight is Stuart Farr from Hudson Valley Hops and Grains in Ancramdale, New York, which is in Columbia County. And John Langdon is from uh, Copake from Langdonhurst Farms. And we'll be seeing a very unprofessional video that I made of their, uh, of their farm, just to give you a little tour. So I guess I'm just going to share my screen here and we'll, uh, we'll get into it. And if I may add before we start, um, if everyone could turn their video off for the time being, it does help with connection as well for when we have videos playing. And then for the Q&A at the end, I would love it if you would um, turn them back on as well. Thank you so much. Sorry, Aaron. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so this meeting is definitely a um, collaboration and we wanna thank uh, Sarah for funding. And just for our agenda tonight, we're gonna to talk a little bit about uh, very quickly one slide about what we wanna consider in our grain systems. I've got a couple tables to compare some capital costs. Then we're gonna see a couple videos to tour a couple farms and a couple processes. Uh, and then I have some more slides to talk about uh, storage, uh, cleaning and drying. So things you want to consider, certainly your costs and also efficiency, especially for small farms, you know, your labor efficiency is really important. And hopefully you're, you're not saying, well, you know, my time's not worth anything. Uh, time is worth at least 25 bucks an hour by the time you pay yourself and pay taxes and insurance and all that. 25 is probably pretty low. Uh, you want to think about the longevity of the system. Um, and, and this goes for if you have a system with steel bins or if you're using bags. Uh, all these principles apply to the whole gamut. Then there's a, a management, we like to call it SLAM. You want to think about sanitation, uh, keeping the grain clean, uh, getting out the fines, how you're moving it around, the loading, uh, aerating. And again, if you have bags or bins, there has to be aeration. Uh, and, and monitoring. How are you keeping track of moisture and temperature? Safety is very important. Uh, I don't know. I know I have. I've slipped on the floor because I had some wheat on the floor that spilled and it's like little ball bearings. So safety all through the system. And uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act. It's a federal regulation. It affects mostly large operations. But if you, you know, you really need to be selling clean and healthy grain, whether it be for feed or for food. And FISMA applies to both food and feed grains. And if you're selling grains to an operation, uh, they, you know, they have regulations they have to com uh, comply with. And so they're concerned about what's coming into their operation. So this is a list of recalls due to pathogens in uh, grains, grain products in the past few years. And in fact, in 2019, there were quite a few uh, recalls. So it's something we do need to be concerned about. And most especially because, you know, we're not heating up, when we process grains, we're not heating them up until like the baking process if you're making bread. So it's easy for pathogens to get in there and survive. Okay, capital costs. So I just put together some figures. I did not shop around. Mostly all these numbers are from one source, one supplier. So if we look at flat bottom bins, okay, if you have a big bin, you know the capital cost, this is the cost to purchase a 30 foot diameter bin. And so that includes the, the base, the cement work, the fans, and um, the un unloading auger and, and all that. So it's a complete bin. 
we're looking at two, for capital cost 276 a bushel. Uh, obviously, when you get to a smaller size bin, a flat bottom bin, you know, it can go up to $628 a bushel. And then hopper bottom bins are a little bit uh, more capital cost intensive than our flat bottom bins. And shipping containers. I got a couple slides of shipping containers. Um, these can be pretty cost effective, but I think we have to be careful how we use them. Um, and these prices, again, are especially for shipping containers, are very variable. This is a used price for a 20 foot and a 40 foot. Uh, and so the prices change very quickly. So these, again, these prices are just for ballpark. Uh, the Kilbros grain box, these are new prices for just the box. Um, so unless you can get something really cheap, it's probably uh, not as cost effective as a bin. And I guess, again, this depends on your size, how much grain you need to store. And this is a, 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 a Kilbros box with a running gear on it. Um, pallet hopper bins, the plastic bins, these uh, are good for, you know, they're very versatile, but again, $23.81 a bushel uh, for a capital cost. And then um, you, can, you can extend these up a little bit and that would increase their, oops, I'm sorry. That will increase their uh, efficiency a little bit. And then nylon bags are fairly cheap. Um, but then there's a whole system of how you're going to use those bags and store them. And then the nylon totes, the one ton totes, are about a buck five a bushel. And again, think of labor because each system is different and it's going to have a different labor requirement. Um, the screw and aerators, which are pretty common for uh, small scale operations, they can range from 98 to $270 for the fan, and the tubes can be fairly expensive as well. A GTE batch dryer, we're looking at $29,000 new. And if you assign 10 cents a bushel, uh, for a payback, you have to grow 5,800 acres. And sometimes we put um, corrugated pipe or aeration pipe in the bottom of a, of a bin or a, a, a box to dry grain. And of course, drainage pipe is fairly cheap. Uh, it's important to use it properly. In the bin, in one bin at uh, Stewart's farm, he has a rocket bin dryer, which goes in a hopper bottom bin. I don't know the price for that, but that's a, an effective system for drying. And then we have augers, which have a range in price. So that if you don't know prices, that's kind of a, uh, a general overview. So now, I guess uh, at this point, are there any questions before we get a little video tour of, of John's farm? Folks, you should feel free to ask questions. Um, I, even though I said put the questions in the chat, if there's questions about the first section, you should feel free. Now, because I'm sharing my screen, I can't see the chat box. So someone will have to uh, verbalize those questions for me. Yeah, we will read them to you, Aaron, but most of them were things like, you know, are you going to have the PowerPoint presentation available? So, yeah. okay, you can keep going, I think. Well, then I'm going to. Uh... Welcome to Langdonhurst Farm in Copake, Columbia County, New York. Here they grow corn, soybeans, and several small grains for both feed and food. This video is a brief tour to show some of the components of a modern grain farm. 
the principles and steps in handling and storing grain are essentially the same if you use modern technology or not. There are a variety of bins to store grain for different markets here, and they also custom store grain for a local distillery. The grain center is arranged primarily for safety so that trucks can pull around and never have to back up. Grain from the field can be transferred to specific bins either by an auger or it can be dumped into the sump which takes it to the grain tower and then it is transferred to a specific bin. Grain that needs drying first goes into a wet bin and from there it is transferred to the continuous grain dryer. After it is dry it is augered to a cooling bin where it continues to lose a little bit of moisture. Once cool, the grain is transferred to a storage bin for long-term storage. In the storage bin, the fans have to be run to aerate the grain to cool it down further as winter comes and also to keep moisture from con condensing. Bins are unloaded by an auger in the floor to a transfer auger, which takes it to the grain tower. And from the grain tower, it takes it to the surge bin then when a truck comes and is loaded, the surge bin can empty itself very quickly. Some of the small grains are dried in bins. These bins have a propane heater in line with the aeration fan. There are also stirrers in these two bins to dry the grain more evenly. Without stirrers, the bottom layer of grain would dry to a low, lower moisture content than the top layer. You can only bin dry a grain a couple feet deep at a time, four feet deep without stirrers and about nine feet with stirrers. Dried small grains are then stored in the hopper bins and each week the local distillery comes to clean a batch and take it for malting. This is where cleaning is set up for small grains. Grain from the pallet bins is augered up and diverted to the cleaner. First, the grain falls through the, the top screen with large holes. Large chaff is sifted off, and the grain lands on a screen with small holes where the small chaff falls through. Then a stream of air blows off the other chaff. Hope you have enjoyed the tour. Okay. So that's, you know, a very quick tour of a very, uh, a pretty sizable operation. Um, so I don't know, are there any questions for John? Um, he's here with us and he can, if you have any other questions about that, you can bring them up now. Uh, is there some <clears throat> some kind of manifold on the bottom of the uh, bins where the um, uh, air comes in from the heat the the blower? Yeah, there's a perforated grain floor. <clears throat> it's about 12 inches of airspace, and that goes across the whole entire bottom of the bins. Thanks. You're welcome. Anyone else? Don't miss your chance. <laughs> so, so Aaron, you mentioned um, uh, perforated drain pipe. You know, we have these uh, bit round metal bins with concrete floors that have a uh, air inlet on the side. Um, would hooking up the uh, perforated drain pipe and making a coil of that on the bottom be a uh, reasonable way to distribute air from the bottom of the grain? Yeah, there's a bunch of different options. <laughs> a lot of them, originally, the older ones, they put a channel in the concrete base with just a kind of a cross pattern. 
it, obviously to have the, the whole perforated floor is, is better for air distribution. Um, but you can do that. You can even lay in perforated pipe on top of the floors. There's a plethora of different ways you can actually just get airflow through the bins. So again, you want to think efficiency. Um, how does the grain come out? And usually it's that last grain uh, with, the, with the aeration floor, a perforated floor, and an auger, you know, you can pretty much get all of it out. Um, if you put a coil of drainage pipe in there, you can, it may be low capital cost, but you got to think about the time to get that last bit of grain out. Uh, Jason, do you want to ask your question? I think Jason wants to know what scale. So you, uh, do you want to unmute yourself? Well, I'll read his question. What scale acreage planted does this service? What's the minimum size that this would be practical for from a capital standpoint? As far as the, uh, <clears throat> the amount of bins and size that we have, you'd have to be somewhere around 2,000 acres. And then there, there's the opposite end of the spectrum. There are a couple questions on um, what, what's a smaller version of this. And um, that is, uh, that's great. I think we should hold those questions until um, Aaron goes a little further because he shows the opposite end of the spectrum as well. The reason why I started with kind of a large operation and what seems to be a complex system is because again, each principle in this big system applies to every other grain handle. Don't think just because you, you're using bags or a little hopper bin that you don't have the same principles of physics and heat and aeration that, you know, uh, that they don't apply to you because they really do. So we can go to a smaller system here. This is Hudson Valley Hops and Grains. Ooh. Okay, we're gonna, this is the Stuart Farr's operation. Welcome to Hudson Valley Hops and Grains, owned and operated by Stuart Farr. Hops and small grains are grown or organically with little outside help. Some value adding is also done, like dehulling and pressing oil from sunflower. Starting out, Stuart tried to work with the old barn, but found it was very inefficient and too costly to renovate. He will be taking it down and a new building will be constructed. Labor efficiency is very important for handling low value crops like grain. The newer building at the end of the grain bins is where the grain cleaning and processing is done. Various types of storage are used for the grains. The hopper bottom bins are the primary structures for longer term storage. Grain wagons and pallet bins are for temporary storage. One grain wagon has an aeration floor inside and is used for drying small lots of grain. Grain is mostly dried in the hopper bottom bins with air and one bin has a grain guard rocket dryer. An electric heating element is installed in line with the centrifugal fan. This heat distributor is assembled inside the bin. The heated bin has a temperature sensor inside you can see its cable coming down the ladder. The typical process for storing grain is to clean it before going into the bin. This improves aeration and prevents storage problems. This rotary screen is best suited for corn and soybeans. Consider that the range in seed size is greater in corn and soybeans, soybeans than in small grain. So matching the proper screen size is easier with larger grains. We will see a video of it in a minute. The bins can discharge grain into a flexible auger or out of a secondary spout. Some of the augers have plastic flighting, which is less damaging to the grain. The flexible auger carries grain into the grain processing building and can discharge it into a clipper cleaner or into a bagger. The clipper has a variety of screen sizes to sift out large and small chaff. 
screens shake, separating the chaff from the grain, and a flan blows chaff away as well. A gravity table is used when necessary. The gravity table separates different seeds from each other and from stones by their differences in density. Screw and aerators are used for drying grain in wagons or pallet bins. These fans from automated farm systems have been very reliable. And rather than pay over $100 for the screw and aeration tube, a length of PVC drainage pipe is used. A nylon stocking covers the ends and the holes. The tube is placed in the bin or wagon before it is filled with grain. This hopper on wheels helps make filling grain sacks efficient. Lots of planning makes this operation efficient for one person to run. The proper flow rate of the grain is needed for everything to work right. The first screen retains the large chaff and discharges it halfway down the barrel through two holes. The wheat falls through the large screen and is retained on the second smaller screen, while the small chaff goes through the smaller screen onto the ground. The clean wheat comes out of the end and is transferred to the bin by another auger. However, some wheat is lost with the large chaff and some seed heads are plugging the screen and some are coming out with the clean wheat. Using a rotary screen for small grains is, is tricky. Okay, I'm gonna go right to another video that shows the clipper. There are a lot of moving parts on this clipper grain cleaner. A screen with large holes and one with small holes are shaking back and forth. Under each screen, a brush moves back and forth to keep holes from plugging. The fan is blowing air. Air ducts are used to bring in and exhaust air for the fan. A belt carries the clean grain out where it makes its way to a bagger. Lastly, magnets remove any metal in the grain. Okay, any, any questions about this operation? Um, so you have a question about conversion of uh, standard or harvestor type silos. I see they, they have some standard concrete silos there. Yeah. Uh, was was there any consideration of that in the in in that operation to begin with? Stuart, I'll let you take that. Yeah, the, the existing silos that were there were very old and, and, and cracked and and they were unserviceable essentially. So 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 it would be in a different situation, but not in ours. They they weren't reusable. I see. Thank you, Stuart. I do have an example of a converted silo later on in the presentation talk about that again. Okay, great. Thank you. Aaron, yes. there seems to be something with your audio. It's sort of cutting in and out. Is there anything we can do to yeah. work with that? a different set of headphones. Okay. 
Because sometimes it's good and sometimes it's less good. <clears throat> Is that any better? Deborah, what do you think? We'll no, actually, <coughs> it actually seems worse. Worse, okay. Well, Maybe just get close to your computer, I guess. <laughs> Is that any better? Yes. Okay, we'll go with that for now. Let me know if it gets worse and I'll try another trick. Um, so I have a question. My name is Faith and we have a farm in um, Burlington County, New Jersey. Um, we are just transitioning our first crop of um, Redeemer wheat. We have about 15 acres. So I was just curious, um, you know, if we're not, since we're just starting out, we don't have the capability to do all this processing. Um, so if we, you know, if we just do the drying part on our end and then the transportation to another, you know, mill that could potentially do the, the rest of the processing, you know, what would you recommend for the drying and the storage for us until we can get to the mill? Would the grain wagon work and how much would that hold? So there's different size grain wagons, um, typically a couple hundred bushels. And we'll look at a little grain wagon system. Uh, I definitely need a tarp to keep critters out of the top of it. Um, but you can, yeah, you can fabricate just like Stuart had there, his, his grain wagon that was aerated. You wanna talk about that, Stuart? Yes, for that quantity, so you're gonna be looking at, you know, plus minus 15 tons. Um, a couple of gravity wagons would be probably the right solution. The, the perforated floor I put in is very, very simple. As the uh, wag, as the box, the gravity box transitions from a vertical side to a sloping side, I just put some angle iron around that, uh, that angle there, uh, put some right angle iron in, 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 the, in the less than right angle uh, side. And that was then the base supported a frame, a uh, steel frame with some perforated uh, steel sheets over it. Um, so it's very simple, uh, and then cut a hole in, in the bottom of the wagon and, and uh, uh, hooked up a, a fan. I have the fan for other reasons, drawing holes mainly, um, and blow air through, and that works really well. Um, I've mainly used it for sunflower. I've used it for sunflowers, for beans, and for grains, and it, uh, the key is getting airflow with all grain, grain drying or any drying. It's airflow is the key to drying it. So um, it's a very simple system. It's very affordable. Um, but the key is having a powerful fan and by powerful, the one I use is five horsepower. It doesn't necessarily have to be that, but it, it needs to be a fan that shifts a lot of air uh, through the grain. But I, I think that's for that sort of size operation, that's, that's, a, that's certainly a, a valid uh, approach. Thank you, Stuart. Any other questions? I have a question about that gravity box setup, which is intriguing. Uh, it sounded like the air was being pushed in from the bottom. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, it, it's it's definitely push, and and you can feel it as well. You can. Uh, it's not a pull. It's definitely a push up through the bottom. So the bottom of the gravity wagon effectively acts as a big plenum to even out the the pressure, um, and then it that the the pressure in that plenum gets pushes the air through the through the grain that sits on top of the perforated floor. And does your perforated floor then have a a way to open like a trap door or something so that you can that yes that you you you've nailed the floor with the system right there. So I have a a fairly unsatisfactory trap door that requires a fair bit of shoveling to get to it. Um, it was really a proof of concept but but a better design would be a sliding you know, a trap door that you could you could you could pull uh, through the side, or have a cable that pulls it through the side to to avoid what I do right now, which is shovel until I can get to it. And one so last that's the best approach. Yes, thank you. That's all very very good information. And one last question is the diameter of the pipe uh, that's going in. 
for the air. That's eight, yeah, that's eight inches. Um, and that's just because eight inches is the is the outlet of the fan. So I just got an eight inch pipe, yeah. uh, flexible pipe from the fan into the, uh, you know, into the into the transition into the gravity wagon. Great. Thank you very much. Other questions? So drying grain is really a very technical management process. And I have a couple manuals referenced at the end of the, of the presentation because really, you know, there's a lot to know about it and uh, it's pretty detailed. So it's good to have a good handbook with you. Okay, the next video. Oop. The next video is about a bagging system at Small Valley Milling. storing yeah, this in here feel the floor how cold it is compared to the outside oh yeah that's nice that's, feel that yeah, it's natural it's refrigeration yeah they're in, these are insulated trailers yeah so he's just saying that these insulated reefer trailers make for excellent storage because one of the first things you said to me after you'd been adding on to the mill is that you still didn't have enough storage space in there once it's bagged you know out of the well, bin. That's what the, all these trailers have stuff in. So can we do the um, Henry, can you explain um, why you like this method of storage, how it works for you? Uh, one of the one of the big things is I have different lots, different fields. I put it in bags. And I can go in here in my reefer and I can pull out what I want. I can mix and match. I can pull out what I want for seed. Uh, everything was just put in a bin on top of each other. Yeah, it'd be all mixed. And, and at this point, it might be important to, to, to mention to folks that you're not only selling flour and berries as food, you're also selling einkorn seed. Yeah. So you're making a determination after each season you're testing the grain, you're seeing, you're looking at germ, you're looking at seed size, right? Yeah. And how, what, what, how does that, how do you do then, what kind of seed goes with, with what product usually? Uh, it, it varies so much year by year. One of the number of things, of course, is germ. We need seed that has a good germ. The other thing that we look at is vomitoxin. If we have some that is just slightly high in vomitoxin, has a good germ, that might be a candidate for seed. And of course, we're always looking for fields that were weed free. That's a very important thing. For the, for the seed. For the seed, For yes. the seed, yes, yeah. And so just as a reminder for you folks, all of us in the Northeast that are growing any kind of wheat, einkorn is a type of wheat, wheat, rye, barley, we have to be very concerned every year, test every year for fusarium um, infection that results, that can result in vomitoxin. And so Henry, like everybody else, he has, he has a very good track record of keeping that vomitoxin low, but you can never tell. So what he's suggesting, since um, uh, fusarium is ubiquitous, uh, it is possible to, to plant seed that's slightly infected, um, that may, for example, have a vom of over one part per million, which is the FDA guideline that it has to be one part per million or under as a finished product to be um, sold to humans. So this, this is a nice, I know several growers that do this. Is this refrigerated at all? No, it is not. Another thing I'd like to mention is since I'm using this reefer, I have not had uh, granule weevils. I, I have not had a problem with stuff like that now, infecting the grain. Now, what, what do you attribute that to? Uh, I'm not sure, but it just seems I can broom it out. It's, it's, it's fiberglass and it's metal. 
Uh huh. There's no wood for the I uh, see. stuff to hide in. Right. It, it just seems to work. And notice that it's that it's rodent proof. Very important for. That is very important. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is this is. I know that Henry. At one point, you were thinking of putting up some bins. I was. But you decided that for what you're doing, and it makes sense with all your mixing and matching, because remember that Henry is also a miller. So he's he's um, he's changing up um, as he's getting reports back from his bakers, right? <laughs> and we always want to pull out stuff that has the highest quality gluten for bread flour, and the stuff not quite as high quality gluten goes for other baked goods so that's another place where we're separating yeah and don't want it all in one bin so are those sacks are the whether they've 50 to 80 pounds or uh, it's usually 55 to 70 pounds in there and and remember that this is this idea can be scaled up too for example i know people that have actual semi semi uh truck trailers so bigger trailers than this and if you have something like that you can also store in there ton totes right. um, so this this idea is is really really sound and of course it's much less expensive than certainly buying a new bin oh, yes. yeah, yeah right okay hopefully you can hear me better my headphones decided to work no it's it's actually not working sorry you can't hear me now? That's better, yeah. Okay. So any any questions uh, about that short video about bagging? Actually, before we do that, let me talk about this bagging system. This is from, uh, this is from Lamar Stauffer in New Holland, Pennsylvania. Uh, he has 20 foot, 21 foot uh, reefer trailers. And he also stores totes and bags. One thing, some comments, I talked to uh, Henry and to uh, Small Valley Milling. They said it's very important to put either cardboard on the bottom of your pallets or have a solid bottom pallet so when the forks go in, they don't hit the bags that might be peeking through the cracks. Uh, in this trailer here, there's a reefer to keep everything cool and Lamar also added a dehumidid dehumidifier. And by keeping things cool and dry, you reduce uh, the problem with any pests. So usually bugs stop being active uh, below 50 degrees and uh, you don't wanna have any humidity or condensation in there. So rather than using a trailer reefer, there's a thing called a cool bot which is basically a, refrig uh, a uh, air conditioner that is modified. There's kits for modifying the air conditioners and you kind of trick the thermostat on it so that you can go to uh, lower temperatures than what you would need in the room of a house. Okay, any, any questions about bagging? Uh, Christopher Ross here, Aaron. So are those, are those, is the grain in there dried before it goes into the bags or is it uh, just harvested dry? Well, I'm not exactly sure how these farmers are doing it, but before the grain goes into that trailer, it does need to be dry. Uh, I do have a photo, it's an ancient photo of uh, a system for drying bags, basically using a hair dryer. Ah. Yeah, that slide is coming up, but you can, you know, harvesting grain is very tricky because sometimes the field edges are a little wet, you know, they're green from the shade and the center of the field may be dry. Um, so, and then, you know, if rain is coming, you may want to get it before it's fully dry. So there's a whole, there's a whole management uh, problem and, and whole management system for dealing with harvesting. Thank you, Aaron. Other questions? Okay, so here's a, a, a shipping container. So this shipping container is used for feed. It's not used for grain storage. So this is an organic dairy. 
they drop in their uh, feed through here and then they come in with the skid steer and pull it out. So this, this feed is always coming in and coming out and it's, it's always on the move, which is uh, very important to understand for, for the storage. So they don't, they don't have any moisture problems. In the winter time, they don't have grain freezing to the sides. I think that's mostly because they're moving it so often. Uh, these containers do get very hot in the summer, and I think that can be a management issue. Uh, if I were to use one of these for grain storage, for long-term storage, I think I would want it in the shade because if you're getting over 100 degrees in there and then shutting the doors, uh, you could have a problem. So is I it? Go on, question. Tell us about the 100 degree in the summer problem in the bin. Well, so if you're, you can uh, kill the germ of the seed. And if you get into, you know, very high temperatures during the day, then the sun goes down at night and it gets down to 60 degrees, uh, you're going to be getting moisture condensation in there. It only takes a 15 degree difference in temperature for moisture to condense. So you have to keep that 15 degrees in mind. So I have a little artwork here to show a, um, oh, kind of a, a bulkhead here. If you were to build up this bulkhead, let me go. So you can see there's a slot right at the end of the, of the um, shipping container. And I think you could use that to make a bulkhead. And if as you would make a bulkhead, it'd have to be about six feet high here. And then if you had like a maybe two to a three foot PVC pipe, six inch diameter, you could stick it in there, fill it up with grain. And then you could open the doors and just stick your four inch uh, auger in there to pull out what you need. You could make an aeration floor. You could either make a plywood floor, which uh, actually plywood is over 50 bucks a, a sheet for three quarter inch plywood. So it's pretty expensive right now. Or you could use, you know, the four inch perforated pipe and uh, design a, a floor first, something like this. You could also, you know, if you made a permanent floor, you could probably have a permanent auger or channel right down the middle. And then you would um, not have to move a four inch auger all the time. So again, with this labor efficiency, getting that last little bit of grain out. So any questions about shipping containers? So this is at Hudson Valley Farm Hub. They have a building where they're keeping their totes. The advantage of this is where you don't have that temperature variation, you don't have the what we call moisture migration. Okay, you don't have moisture going from uh, a cold side of a building or a bin uh, to the grain. Here they use those uh, screw and aerators. So if you can keep bags or even there was a farm that came to talk at one of our meetings once and they actually had their bins inside of a barn and modifying that temperature uh, is a great way to help manage uh, grain and storage. So these aerators, unfortunately, they do not tell you the cubic feet per minute of air that they deliver. Um, and so you can't rely on them to take out a lot of moisture. Okay, it's only, you know, I would, I'm not sure if I would use on grain that had more than 16% moisture and typically small grains, we have to dry down to about 13 or 14% moisture. So that aeration and whether or not it's gonna be effective is gonna be determined by the initial grain temperature, uh, its moisture, uh, the amount of chaff, which affects the airflow and the humidity of the air you're blowing into it. If you're, if you're um, pulling a small grain off the field in July, August, and it's coming off the field at 80, 90 degrees, and you put it in a shipping container or in a tote, and you can't get air to it to dry it down, and if it's at 16% moisture, it's only going to last about a week. If it's at 18% moisture, 
which is what we harvest malting barley at, uh, that's only three days. So having the capacity to aerate is really important. Here's an innovative farmer. So as you look at this, these, uh, the piping, uh, this is a loop. So this is one end and this is the other end of the same pipe. And that way at the distant bag you have, and through the bags you have a more constant air pressure. If you were just a dead end this pipe somewhere down here in one of these bags, you'd have a very great difference in air pressure from the first bag to the last. And I'm not an engineer, but I think if you had a plenum on this end, basically a box and then attach the pipe to that box, I think you'd have better air flow and better capacity. And he's just using a uh, drainage pipe for the aeration tube. So here's another example of a gravity wagon bin. These are, uh, one has an auger, one doesn't. This is for rye that's grown. Uh, these are just open, put under the shed, and you can see that squirrels like to get in there and have dinner. So you gotta think about the Food Safety Modernization Act, even if it's uh, just for feed grain. You don't wanna get droppings or any uh, contamination in there. So Mark Renault has had good luck with the system for what he's doing. Um, he hasn't had storage mold. He harvests his fields when they're dried down. Uh, he did say that, you know, sometimes the edges of the fields are a little green, maybe. So he will mix that, you know, harvest part of the green and part of the dry to mix it together and even out that moisture. Here's our converted harvest store. This is at the Migliorelli farm down in uh, near Red Hook. So for about $2.50 a bushel, he converted this harvest store. He um, put a lot of work into it. He flex sealed all the seams and bolts. Uh, the roof needed a lot of work. You can see the stripes of metal that he had to add to each seam. I guess he told me that the blue roofs are a lot better. This is the inside of the bin. Here's an aeration floor. So there's uh, about a foot or so of space under that perforated floor. And this is a uh, sweep. So once you get to the bottom of this bin, uh, the grain is only gonna flow at a certain angle and then it's gonna stop. So this sweep rides along the top of that, of that remaining grain to uh, auger it into the center of the bin and into the auger for discharge. So this sweep, the end of the sweep has to be lifted up before you start filling the bin. And then the grain is gonna stop flowing at a certain angle and the sweep runs along the top of the grain. Here's the discharge auger. And uh, Ken uses a grain vac to fill up this bin, to blow that grain all the way to the top. Concrete bins can also be converted. Uh, you really need to be an engineer or have an engineer come and evaluate the structure first and then figure out what needs to be done. Uh, corn cribs, we talked a little bit about that earlier. Uh, they're a good way to store grain. Air does have to get through that mass of corn, so you can't just make it as big as you want. And there's actually, I was going through my file drawer and I have an old, it's probably a 1940s or 1950s publication about corn cribs. And that's uh, on our blog that you will have the address to. So a little bit about grain drying. Aaron, uh, excuse me, while you're on the topic of yep. corn in cribs, I just wanted to get back to the question that I asked Ted, because I was curious if, if we were the only people that tried to keep corn almost all the way till the next harvest, because our, uh, the insect situation is horrible with both the weevils and the um, Indian meal moths. 
Um, and, you know, every time we do this, I think no one in their right mind would try to keep it that long. They'd probably shell it in February or something and, um, you know, try to protect that shelled corn better. Um, what, are you, what are your thoughts about that? Well, so the Indian meal moth is only a problem on cracked and broken kernels. Uh, the weevils typically aren't a problem when the corn is dry. Uh, if the kernels are dry and um, if the temperature gets down there, their activity will, will be low. So have you had a lot of insect trouble in your cribbed corn? Oh, it's, it's terrible every year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I guess I, I don't have the experience with cribs to really give you uh, an answer to that. One, another, another thing is, you know, sometimes farms have lights near their bins and, you know, lights attract insects at night. So it certainly don't have any lighting around the bins. Um, I've never heard about treating ear corn, but you can probably treat it with diatomaceous earth if you're organic, or um, there's other pesticides you can use if you're uh, conventional. Well, we've uh, tried, you know, spraying it with BT on the way in. Mm -hmm. um, if the meal moths are only a problem on broken grain, maybe they're a problem on rodent chewed grain. I mean, I don't, I don't see us breaking much in the process, but um, we're pretty much rat proof, but not necessarily mouse proof. I don't think we have a lot of rodents, um, but then if, if weevils are opening the kernels, then maybe moths are getting in through, through those openings. Right, weevils would be your primary test and then moths are a secondary test. Um, so we've been, we've been trying to get all that corn out at least for a few weeks before we start filling again, but I don't know how the weevils would survive in between and if any treatment, you know, organically approved treatment would be, uh, appropriate. We do a pretty good job, I think, on the sanitation, um, but it seems to be a perennial problem. Yeah. I don't know. Does anyone else have any experience or advice they want to share? Another comment I'll make um, is that to, uh, to prevent pest problems from building up, it's important to keep things moving. So emptying bins, um, like at Stewart's farm, he makes it a point to store his grain because it's easy to protect it in the bins. And then when he processes it, he doesn't, he doesn't process an inventory and keep an inventory of processed grain he processes it, processes it and then sells it and moves it out. So there's nothing laying around for bugs or rodents to get. Are there any other questions about the previous slides, the harvest store or anything else? Okay, so when we're drying grain, we're blowing air underneath this perforated floor and moisture is moving from this lower level grain and it's going up and we create what's called the moisture front. And this moisture front slowly moves up the mass of grain and it keeps moving and we have to keep the fans on until that moisture front completely exits the grain. If we have a humid day and we decide to shut the fans off, that moisture front's gonna get stuck right there and you're gonna have 20, 22% moisture possibly and uh, you're going to have a, a moldy layer right there. It's important also to have vents in that uh, shipping container. A vent would have to be added there to be able to aerate the, grain, the, the grain properly. As grain sits in the bin and it gets cold outside, uh, the, the sides of the bin are going to be cold. Air is going to sink. It's going to dry out this grain because um, 
is what we call moisture migration. It dries out and this air current is gonna pull that moisture to the middle of the uh, bin. And because this grain is warm, the air rises like a chimney effect and we have a concentration of moisture right there in the column of the bin. So we have to aerate the bins uh, periodically to keep them uh, cool and certainly within 15 degrees of the, of the average monthly temperature. Fans, so we have basically three types of fans. The axial fan here on the right is uh, the least expensive, but it doesn't create a lot of pressure. The centrifugal fan creates the most pressure. It's a little bit more expensive. And the inline axial, the inline centrifugal fan is kind of uh, halfway in price and halfway in performance between the, uh, the centrifugal fan and the axial fan. So matching the fan to the to what your needs are is an important process. So John talked about putting grooves in the bottom of the bin. This can be either a groove with a perforated cover, or it could be a drainage pipe to aerate uh, the massive grain. Uh, how we lay the pipes and how we space them is important. For drying, that spacing has to be half the depth of the grain. If the grain going in is dry, uh, that spacing can be a little bit more if we're just aerating the grain. So we need tools for monitoring. This is a compost thermometer, about a three or four foot stem. Uh, that helps you determine the, the uh, temperature of the grain at the top to see if that moisture front moved through. I bought a little temperature cable for my multimeter because it has a temperature setting on it, temperature uh, measurement on it. Uh, unfortunately, this cable was about 15 degrees off. And whenever you buy a temperature, you have to check it to be sure if it's actually accurate. This is a grain thermometer. You can you screw in a 3 8 inch threaded rod here and um, you can push that into the grain. And this is a common uh, moisture meter. So you need some way of measuring temperature and moisture. So these are the bins at Stewart's place. Um, I didn't really give the particulars of the bins in the, in the video, but it's a three horsepower fan, a five kilowatt heater. And uh, the bins are rated, that, the bins are rated by tons. And this is the amount of bushels of grain you can can't fill it up with soybeans because soybeans are awfully heavy. And so this barn is going to be taken down and the processing of grains will, be take, will take place in the new building. And again, only process what you need and don't keep an inventory around. Here's another. This is at the, the Hudson Valley Farm Hub. This is a propane heater in line with the centrifugal fan. This is something I just found online, a portable heater that you can uh, put in front of a aeration fan if you want to add a little heat. Also, you know, so from here to here is, is airspace and there's the aeration floor along those uh, bolts there. So bugs accumulate under here, the weevils accumulate under here. And one way to get rid of them is by heating up that floor to about 140 degrees uh, for 15 minutes or so. Now all that chaff is a great insulator. So you have to be sure your time of heat is long enough to uh, penetrate all that insulating chaff. This is a batch dryer. So, the grain comes in and it's circulated. There's a auger through the middle. You have a plenum here of heated air. It turns, it's got automatic control so you can turn it on and off. It turns on and off uh, based on how you set it. So this is at um, Cliff Wilbur's farm in Easton. This is a, tr a top drying see it better right here, a top dry bin. So there's a floor about a quarter of the way up 
third of the way up the top of this bin. The grain sits up here on top of the perforated floor. You're throwing heat into it. And then when you, once it's mostly dry, uh, louvers drop the grain to the bottom of the bin. And so you have hot grain and you let that heat, you capture that heat coming off of that grain to help dry the next batch. So what Cliff has done is he stuck a wood stove inside of this housing. And with about six to eight cords of wood, he saved himself $10,000 the first year because his propane burner here always stayed on low instead of kicking to high. And he's used the system for about 15 years now. Nothing like good farmer innovation. So here's another very old publication I posted on our blog for you to look at. Uh, here's basically a hay drying fan and there's a square frame and we're packing the bags the same depth on the top and sides and blowing air through it to dry the grain from the bags. So I think that would, um, you know, if, I wouldn't do this with high moisture grain. Uh, I think if you need to just reduce the moisture a couple points, that would be about all that system can handle. Someone got a SARE grant and, and made a little portable drying bin with a culvert and aeration floor and stuck it on a pallet. This is a, a malting operation where Rick Dennis at Argyle Crafts and Malts, he, um, he uh, if you walk in this room, he's got a bin on this side and on this side. This is the plenum where this fan blows into the plenum and then this floor has little slots cut through it and he's able to dry uh, his batch of grain using this. That seems to work for him. This is just a little simple bagger that he made. So cleaning grain. Any, any questions up to now? It's 7.10, so we'll kind of breeze through the rest of this and uh, hope we have a discussion. So when we're cleaning grain, you know, we depend on size, density, shape, texture, uh, stickiness of the, of the grain and the seeds. So here's cheat grass and rye seed, very hard to separate. Uh, as I was thinking, you know, and all these seed cleaners are actually fairly expensive. And I was trying to think of, uh, you know, a cheap way to separate and clean seed. And I was thinking about seed bouncing, you know, seeds must bounce differently. And I did a little internet search and there's actually a 1950s patent by someone that was producing bluegrass seed. Uh, he developed a seed cleaner that used the bounce of the seed to separate chaff and unwanted seeds from the good seed. So if you're a fabricator or tinkerer, you might want to look that up. I played around with it in my barn for about two hours and realized that it was much more complicated than it seems. So I'm going to have to have a week of vacation to figure that one out. So in cleaning, Anytime you move seed, it's an opportunity to clean. Um, here at the Kukon Brothers in Columbia County, they have a seed cleaner built into their grain leg. This is the cyclone on the back side to remove all the, all the chaff. At the Migliorelli farm, you know, sometimes you have a couple different seed cleaners. So he puts it through the rotary screen and then through this, uh, what's called the LMC size shaker. And again, you're moving grain. So he's got a fan in front of the flow of grain to blow any chaff away. This Carter Day Uniflow separator that he has will separate uh, like rye seed and vetch seed. But he says it actually works pretty slow. So I think the message here is, you know, there's different types of cleaners and you can see these are not new. So you really got to just find those things sitting in the back of the barn and uh, that no one's using and just figure out how to find that stuff. 
here's a batch dryer, but it's really used, not used for drying so much as it is for cleaning because it has, uh, you're, you're moving the seed and it's got uh, different, a different size screen in there to take out all this chaff right here. This is a Sosnowski grain cleaner. Uh, I don't have any experience with it. I don't know if, it, I didn't see Elizabeth Thick signed up. I'm sure if she, if she is, if she'd unmute, I think she's had some experience with it. Yeah, Erin, she's um, en route back from Maryland. So okay. she's gonna miss tonight. So thank, yeah, uh, we can follow up with that in the next one. Does anyone have any experience with this cleaner? Okay, we're coming down the home stretch here. These spiral separators, they look pretty neat and they work well, but from what I've heard, they're a little slow. Hawthorne Valley has one in Columbia County. This is something else I just found on the internet really for garden seed. You're, um, you're bouncing the seed down these little steps and that black tube is a vacuum. So you're sucking out the chaff. But I'm, you know, you think you'd probably fabricate something where you could drop seed in and at a higher volume and maybe blow the chaff off somehow. But there's lots of ideas out there. Jack Laser from Butterworks Farm got a couple grain bin sections and made a little portable dryer on a wagon. Um, oh, you know, I forgot. I'm going to have to post this mechanical seed cleaning and handling handbook. I forgot to post that, but there's 58 pages with 20 types of seed cleaners, and seven types of seed handling machines. Uh, Aaron, Sam has a question. He's okay. wondering, um, you seem to distinguish pest pressure between grain and bin and clean grain in inventory. Why is that? I'm sorry, the pest pressure? Say that again. Sam, do you want to clarify your question? You were saying that, um, like Stuart, for instance, you were, you were just Distinguishing between the grain he had stored in those bins, and then you were saying he doesn't keep inventory, like processed inventory, because of uh, pest pressure. Right. And why is there more, like, what's the difference? Why is there no pests in the bins? Just because you have the air rushing through? So uh, part of it, you're cleaning it. Uh, you're you're raising it to temperature to dry it, and so I think. Depending on the temperature you're drying at, that can remove, that can kill some insects, especially if you're like doing corn at 140 to 180 degrees. Um, so typically the pests come from the facility itself and I haven't yet seen pests coming in from the field and I've been looking. So pests are coming mostly from the facility. So if you have a clean bin and you put clean grain in it, you know, you shouldn't have a pest problem there. But then you take it out of the bin, uh, it's exposed to everything around, you're running it through a dehuller or a grinder, you're putting it in a bag. And then if that bag sits around, uh, you're just, it's like going down a dark alley. You know, how long you wanna walk down a dark alley? Um, you don't want it laying around uh, for a long time, it just increases the exposure time that pests can get to it. And then if they can complete a life cycle and it's still sitting there, you know, they're gonna, that population is gonna build up. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. So this is a little fanning mill, a little version of the clipper. Again, you know, old equipment is lying around actually was visiting someone the other day and lo and behold, there was one of these things sitting in the barn, not being used. So you got to keep your eye out and have good connections, I guess. And just lastly, you know, know the characteristics of your grain. Every grain is different. They behave differently in storage. They dry differently. They take on moisture differently. Um, 
run through augers differently. So just know your grain and, and how it behaves. So on the um, on our blog, I have uh, all this information that you can go to and, and download. For the do-it-yourselfers, Farm Show Magazine is a really cool magazine. And then there's farmhack.org, which uh, has a lot of stuff that people, farmers have made and, and post it for everyone to, to share. Okay, that's, uh, that's it for me. Um, any questions? Yeah, folks, I'm sorry, we're just a couple minutes over already, but if anyone has any quick questions, please feel free to jump in. Oh, well, Aaron, you were very complete. It looks like there are no questions. <laughs> well, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll make one more comment. Okay. Um, you know, to make your system go, you need to find a good opportunity. I found with businesses, they kind of capitalize on a particular resource. They're really good at using a particular resource, whether it be labor or fixing machinery or finding good deals. And I think with, with grain storage and this and cleaning and processing, you have to be able to find a good deal um, and know how to you know, work with something that's used and repair things to keep your capital costs low because you know, it's grains, even value added grains aren't super high value and the capital investment is very high. So keep your eye out for a good deal. I think that's my closing comment. <laughs> Great. Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you, Aaron, very much for your presentation. It was fantastic. Um, we have one more session left next week. Um, Ruthie and uh, Len and Larry are gonna join us um, to talk about uh, their milling operation. And um, Elizabeth is coming back to talk about uh, marketing. Um, uh, grains. So I think it'll be a really good session. So I'm looking forward to the final session and everyone dialing in for it. Okay. Have a wonderful week and uh, try and eat a nice slice of multi-grain bread when you get stressed about the election. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay, guys, have a wonderful day. All right. Take care. <laughs>